So let's finish with a few dynamic programming problems and then we will move to max flow linear programming and maybe string matching. Uh, so let's look at uh, a bit harder dynamic programming problems. So you have this um, uh, very time-wise, very opportune problem, right? So you are running a business in Texas, right? And uh, for next and many days, okay? <clears throat> Now, as we all know, there are plenty of illegal workers in Texas, right? Now, the point is that uh, if you have too many illegal workers, then American jobs suffer, right? But if you have too few illegal workers, then <coughs> American economy suffers, right? <laughs> and you want to be reelected as the president of the US. And, uh, but it turns out your mood is very volatile. <laughs> and you change <coughs> every day how many illegal workers a business can have. You have an upper limit so that American jobs don't suffer and a lower limit, right? So for each of these uh, N many days, uh, right, uh, for each day, uh, you have an upper limit, <coughs> I forget how I called it uh, in the, you know, say, uh, uh, WI and uh, a lower limit uh, VI, or let's call it UI and upper limit and lower limit for each day I. And this changes <coughs> every day, right? So this is your first day at work, and this is when you get your bonus and you say goodbye to the company, right? Now, <coughs> because <coughs> of uh, this is a highly sensitive political issue, there will be, at the end of each day, there will be a uh, commission checking up how many legal workers you have. And if your numbers are outside this interval, you pay a fine. What is the fine used? To make the big wall, <laughs> okay? On the border with Mexico, right? <clears throat> so your task is, <clears throat> and you, what you can do though, because of human rights activists, Every day you can either fire an illegal worker, hire an illegal work worker, or keep the number of illegal workers the same. Your goal is to find the strategy to pass as many inspections as possible. How would you solve this problem? So once again, say, assume for the simplicity, we start with zero illegal workers here, and you have to, each day, the net change of number of illegal workers can be at most one, right? Uh, you have to decide optimal way to hire and fire uh, people uh, to minimize the number of inspections that you will fail. How would you solve this problem using dynamic programming and help uh, American economy. What will be, yes? Would your subproblem be uh, the number of inspec uh, inspections, the minimum number of inspections you can fail um, by in the end of the day having a many workers on that? Ah, very good. So here is a suggestion our subproblem sub PI uh, J will be a minimal number of uh, inspection 
you fail during the first i days. So notice, even though we care, uh, uh, sorry, assuming on day i, you have um, j many workers. So we significantly generalize uh, the problem, right? Now, uh, i is the index of the day, and j is number of illegal workers. So what is the relationship between j and i, given our assumptions? Every day, you can either hire, keep the number of workers the same, or fire a Worker. So, what is the yeah? Uh, J is the number of workers. Uh, if you start with zero after i many days, how many workers at most can you have? Uh, only i many workers. So we know that J is uh, smaller or equal than i. So you see, this is a typical example of how to generalize a problem to allow a, uh, um, an, uh, an easy recursion. Because then, to find what P i j is, what will be the recursion formula? Right? Well, you coming to i to j from j from the day i minus 1, right? Uh, and how can your j um, change from the previous day? It can either increase for 1, it can decrease for 1, or be exactly the same, right? So, how do you get the max uh, for Pij, optimal um, solution to this problem from the previous day? Yeah? It will be max. OK, uh, here I'll be doing something that you shouldn't do on the final, but I want us to speed us up. I will ignore boundary cases, because obviously um, if uh, at the end of i day you had i many uh, workers, how many workers you must have had uh, a previous day? Yeah? i minus 1, right? Because you can increase uh, uh, to, uh, to hit i, you can do it only from i minus 1, uh, because at the end of day i minus 1, you can have at most i minus 1 work workers. But uh, uh, so this is modulo uh, boundary cases. So what will be max of what? It's P I minus 1, J minus 1, right? Uh, P uh, plus either uh, 0 if uh, you fail inspection. on day i, right? Which means that, um, uh, right, that uh, you are outside of this interval, which would mean uh, that uh, j minus 1 
sorry, that J is outside the interval, right? So if you fail inspection on day I, IE, uh, if uh, I does not belong interval uh, Li UI or plus one otherwise, uh, right? If you are in the interval, so you will uh, pass the inspection on that day, then you have option PI minus one. Um, and I guess we can do it like this so that we don't have to repeat this. PI minus one J, in which case you will keep the number of workers the same, and PI minus one J plus one, right, if, uh, um, if you increase uh, the number of, uh, if you decrease the number of, if you fire on the eighth day uh, one worker. Of course, yeah, uh, we have to distinguish the cases. For example, when J is equal to zero, you cannot fire a worker, right? Um, and as I said, uh, if J is equal to I, right, then to, um, uh, to get to, um, the only way to do it if, is from P I minus one, I minus one by hiring a worker. So this is very, very typical how you generalize problems uh, to allow simple recursion. And once you figure out that dynamic programming problems tend to dramatically simplify because um, uh, the recursion usually is uh, rather simple. Okay, let's do another problem from Dolly. Any questions about this problem? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. It's mean. Very good. You minimize the number of, uh, uh, let's see now. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, maximize. Uh, this will be uh, uh, minimal. So if you maximize this as it's put here, you will minimize the number of uh, uh, failures, right? We are here counting, as I wrote it, uh, uh, the number of successes. So maximizing uh, P it will minimize the number of failures. Um, okay, so now, uh, you remember we said the traveling salesman problem optimization is NP hard, but some, um, <coughs> some restrictive, very, very restrictive versions are actually solvable, and that's one example that you have on the list, so you have a bunch of cities on a straight road, right? Well, no. You have just a bunch of ordered the sequence of cities. Uh, but you can travel directly from any city to uh, any other city. Uh, so this is city uh, one up to city, say, capital N, and you are for every uh, pair i, j, so that i is smaller than j, you are given distance between i and j. So you can always travel only forward direction. So this graph, topologically ordered graph, is uh, um, directed graph and a cyclic, obviously. And you are given the distances between any two uh, cities, I and J, so that I uh, precedes J. And you have not one, but two traveling salesmen. 
<coughs> that uh, have to visit the cities in uh, uh, increasing order of indices, right? Uh, but you can decide who, cho who travels which portion. So say this is travel agent one, I mean uh, traveling salesman one, this is traveling salesman two, and you have to minimize uh, the total distance uh, uh, traveled um, by boat uh, traveling salesman. Yes. Uh, I mean, in a way, you've drawn it like in a straight line, but uh, I guess the cities wouldn't actually be in a line. They could be in different places. Yes. So you are just given, so this is why I said it's uh, kind of a bit confusing for, so the cities are just connected by roads. And the roads do not have to satisfy triangle inequality or, so you have a, uh, it doesn't mean that, say, some of the distances uh, between these two, two pairs is uh, larger or equal than direct distance uh, from here to, from one to that point. Uh, so this is, I draw them on a line just to uh, kind of uh, visually easily represent them, uh, that the indices, they are indexed, right? And you are always allowed to travel from city of with smaller index to the city with larger index. Now, the reason why I like this problem is because it has very tempting uh, wrong solution. And in fact, uh, interestingly enough, there is a solution, I think, on MIT site uh, uh, that is wrong. Um, uh, so, so how would you, so it's very tempting to see how to do the traversal up to CTI, yeah? right? So we want to minimize the total distance traveled up to CTI. Yeah? And we say, okay, assume that, um, assume that uh, one, of them, oh well, okay, let's call this one I, and uh, let's call this J. So assume that you have an optimal solution for the first I cities, uh, right? And in that optimal solution, the other uh, traveling salesman ended up at a city J. How can I extend this uh, to an optimal solution for problem I plus one? Well, a very tempting to say is, uh, I simply look, what is the distance between J and I plus one, and uh, uh, compare it with distance between I and I plus one, and whichever is shorter, of the two, I assign uh, this city to be traveled by uh, the person that is closer to I plus one. Why this does not work? For the total distance, you see, because you do not have sub-problem property, namely, Optimal solution up to I and optimal solution up to I plus one, the optimal solution of, uh, for up to I plus one need not be this type of extension for optimal solution for I for the following reason. You see, it is possible, right, that uh, you have a suboptimal solution 
for i minus 1 and some m city here. So it's a suboptimal solution. But it happens that the distance between m and i is extremely small. So that adding this small distance to something some optimal beats the optimal solution that might be the one going up to m prime, right? And uh, m prime then going to i, because this distance, uh, m prime i, might be much bigger than the distance between m and i, so that even though m prime i minus 1 is optimal solution up to i minus 1, adding this will produce bad solution because this distance is very large, while the distance from a suboptimal solution m, even though the total distance traveled uh, uh, so that the first, the one of them stops at m, the other at i minus 1, is larger than the optimal solution where the, ones, the first one stops at m prime and the second at i minus prime because this addition can change the balance very much. So suboptimal solution might be extendable to a better solution than the optimal solution because the optimal solution has bad last distance, right? So that's really, really important. And uh, this pseudo solution is, you can find it on the web. So how do we solve this problem? You see, because of this fact, that you do not have control, you somehow have to take into account the last distance and previous distances. And to do that, you have to generalize the problem into the, vol into the following fun one. It will be problem... Um, uh, say m or yeah whatever m i is the minimal distance traveled such that uh, one traveling salesman ends at m the other at i. Right, so we need to make this problem, solution to this problem two-dimensional, even though once you see the solution, you will see that it's easy actually to collapse it into one-dimensional recursion. Uh, so how do we now recurse? So assume that this is your i and this is your m. And we want to find optimal solution such that first traveling salesman ends up at m, second traveling salesman ends up at i. So among all possible trajectories, we look the shortest but with extra constraint that one of them has to end up in M and the other one has to end up in CTI. Now, there are two cases and one case is obvious. If, M, if I is not equal to M plus one, right, if there is at least one city in between, what is the optimal solution for mi if uh, uh, i is not equal to m plus 1? So 
optimal solution so that one ends up in M, the other ends up at I. The guy that ends up at I, where could he, the only place he could have come from is from where? These guys stuck at M. So if there are intermediate points, they all have to be traversed by the guy that ends up at I. So in this case, optimal solution is simply opt M I minus one plus the distance between I minus one and I. Now the only interesting case is if M is in fact I minus one, how do we find opt I minus one I? So one of them is stuck at I minus one. And there is nothing between I minus one and I. So where could this guy come from? Sorry? Anywhere before I minus one. Say he came from a certain place K. So then it's trivial how to recurse because this will be mean of opt um, K I minus one plus the distance between uh, k, sorry, between uh, k and i, right? Uh, this will be mean, uh, so, and we have to take mean of, uh, okay, let me, uh, we need two means actually, so let me do a little bit of surgery. So this will be mean of mean of this with respect to all k that are between 1 and, uh, uh, and uh, i minus, and uh, strictly smaller than i minus 1, so it will be i minus 2, smaller or equal. But we have one, uh, one case that we didn't travel. What did, uh, we are missing one case. So we are saying since this guy is stuck here, the only place where I can come up from is somewhere from within. And we find optimal solutions for k i minus 1. Oh, sorry, yes, and we add to uh, the, uh, the very last distance traveled, and we find the sum that adds up to the smallest number, right? But notice here, we exhaustively search for all points in between. We take optimal solution up to k i minus one, add this, and then among all of these, we take mean. So we take into account the length of the very last travel. But there is, is it true that I must have come uh, from somewhere inside? There is one case where this is not true, which is what? Maybe he didn't come from anywhere. So it's just he starts at I, right? So this will be sum of the distances uh, between k and i minus 1 uh, when, uh, uh, sorry, uh, k, sum of the k and uh, um, k plus 1 so that uh, k is, uh, goes between 
so the la uh, is between uh, 1 and i minus 2, right? Because this will then add up to i minus 1 here. So it might be the case that it is better. The optimal solution is that the first guy goes all the way I plus, uh, up to i minus 1, and the second guy starts the tour from i. So notice, so in this way, we now ensure optimal uh, so, subproblem property, right? Because we exhaustively search for all intermediate points from which I, the person ending up at I could have come. We look for optimal traversal so that one comes to K, to K the other comes up to I minus 1, and then we extend this guy, and among those that sum of the last leg plus previous trajectory is as little as possible. So this allows to, uh, to have optimal subproblem property. So as you can see, dynamic programming is actually a pretty subtle technique, but it's for the very same reason is uh, extremely powerful, right? So to recapitulate uh, dynamic programming, what are the ingredients that you should look for uh, when you try to solve a problem using dynamic programming? First, you have to find, you have to generalize the problem such that it has a optimal subproblem property, namely that solution to the optimal solution to the larger problem is obtained from optimal solution of smaller problems. Then you have to see how to order these problems so that you can do recursion. In this case, this was obvious, uh, the subproblems right, uh, had a natural uh, end uh, that um, uh, allows you to index subproblems, but sometimes, as we saw, uh, the, the ordering can be tricky, which is the subject of uh, our uh, next, uh, next problem. A very similar problem is on these additional lecture notes for dynamic programming in which you have to split sequences, uh, a sequence of numbers into two subsequences that have uh, minimal total variation um, between the two, so sum of uh, total variations of the sequences to be uh, as small as possible. And uh, the machinery is exactly the same. So let's do the famous uh, turtle tower problem, which is probably the hardest uh, among all the problems that uh, we look at uh, this course. But it's extremely instructive because uh, it uh, demonstrates all the components of the DP very clearly, right? So what is the problem? You have a bunch of turtles. And each turtle I, so turtle TI, has strength SI uh, and weight wi, right? And you want to stack the turtles on top of each other to make as large, as many of them as possible, but so that you don't crack any of the turtles. So a tower is legitimate if the, for each turtle in the, on this list, say tj, 
sum total of the weights of all turtles that are put on top of it is smaller than SI. Right? So the strength of the turtle should be larger than the weight of all turtles that are stuck on top of it. So here, obviously, we want to recurse adding more and more turtles into the play. But we have to make sure that as we order turtles and build towers from all the turtles up to the eight turtle at, on that list, that you don't miss any solutions, any optimal solutions. What do I mean by that? Well, if turtles are ordered in this way, and at each step, right, if you have certain ordering of turtles, right, and if you recurse uh, this way, right, if you always build the tallest towers up to a build from turtles, first I many turtles or J many turtles, it might be the case that you miss optimal solution because optimal solution requires you one of the later turtles to be placed between previously occurring turtles. So you have to make sure that this cannot happen that the ordering of the turtles is such that if you build the tower from turtles in that order, you don't miss any optimal solutions. And it turns out, and the question was, how do we find out that? Well, I guess by trying other things, probably you can try first to order turtles according to the strength. It won't work, then you try to order them according to the weight. It won't work, and then kind of, I guess, out of despair, you try uh, weight plus uh, strength plus weight. And this is what works here. So we show, so first is uh, determining the initial ordering uh, along which we can recurse without uh, missing uh, optimal solution. And the claim is order turtles uh, by strength i plus weight of i. Now, the claim is uh, if there is a tower of height, of certain height k, in any order of turtles whatsoever, then there will be such a tower of the same height in which the turtles are ordered in increasing strength plus weight. This guarantees, of course, then that you will not miss any optimal solutions uh, because uh, for any solution whatsoever, uh, you can find a solution that is built from turtles ordered in the, in, in the increasing weight plus strength. Let's see why this is so. You would be amazed, for example, the main algorithms in bioinformatics, uh, something called Smith-Waterman algorithm, is a DP algorithm. So the scope applicability is just impossible to overestimate the applicability 
of dynamic programming. Uh, if you are in digital telecommunications, the coding of convolutional codes uh, that is called the uh, Viterbi decoder is a dynamic programming algorithm. So one thing that I'm worried when I present problems such as stacking turtles is that you might get an impression that DP is used only for useless problems. <laughs> but the point is, uh, rather than presenting a whole, if I did Viterbi decoder, which is uh, a very kind of clean dynamic programming, I would have to explain what the convolutional codes are and how we decode them and uh, uh, what is maximum likelihood and what not. Uh, the turtle problem is such that without noise of the particular uh, details of, the, of a real life uh, field, um, it uh, allows uh, to show all the components without going into uh, telecommunications or uh, bioinformatics, right? But don't think that, uh, that this is all what we do. It's a really huge number of uh, immensely, or for example, in speech recognition, um, uh, we use uh, hidden Markov models uh, which are also an application of, uh, um, uh, which involve application of dynamic programming. So it's an extremely powerful technique. And this is why I spend so much time giving you so many examples because this is the main weapon uh, that uh, if you do algorithm design later in your life that uh, uh, you will probably use. Okay, so, so the claim is that we, if we order turtles by this quantity, then for any tower of any size, there exists There exists a tower of the same uh, size ordered by t uh, by uh, what did we say strength plus weight uh, in, in increasing order. In fact, the tower in which the turtles are correctly ordered can be obtained by permuting the original tower. Now, why does this correspond, why does this guarantee that you won't lose optimal solution uh, if you recurse according to strength plus weight? Well, simply because consider your optimal solution and in which turtles can be in any order. By this claim, there you can rearrange this tower to make it monotonically increasing in uh, uh, strength plus weight and still keep it legitimate. No turtle cracks. So why is this so? Well, uh, again, it's the same al um, argument as we use so many times in greedy. It's the bubble sort algo uh, argument. Namely, it's enough to show that if two turtles that are adjacent can be permuted, then this guarantees that uh, there will be a solution with no inversions because if there are inversions, any inversion can be completely rectified by bubble sort, always flipping only two adjacent items. So our initial assumption is that this is a legitimate tower. So this is 
turtle i, turtle i minus one, and this is, uh, well, uh, let's see, tau, let's call turtle small t i, t i minus one up to t one. And our assumption is that this is a legitimate, and assume that ti minus one and ti are inverted. So we are assuming that strength i minus one plus weight i minus one is larger than uh, straight, uh, strength i plus weight i, even though the turtle precedes uh, uh, turtle ti. Our aim is to show that we can flip them and still maintain that this will be a legitimate tower. Why is this so? Well, the fact that the initial tower is uh, correct means uh, that the sum of uh, weight one plus weight two plus all the way to weight i minus one is smaller than strength of the turtle i, right? Because assumption is that the initial uh, tower is correct. Now, if I swap t i minus one and t i, can the turtle t i crack? Is that possible? If I swap these two, ti comes here, now this will become ti, and this will become, uh, and uh, this will, uh, turtle ti minus one. Is it possible that ti can crack? How much weight now does ti see? Uh, less. Of course, ti now sees less weight because before, it also saw the weight of t i minus one. So the only problematic part is that we have to show that the turtle t i minus one will not crack. Well, we have this inequality, right? Let's add to both sides the weight of the turtle i, right? So I'll have W1 plus W2 plus W I minus one plus W I will be smaller than strength of I plus weight of I, right? I'm adding to both sides, I'm adding W I. But what do I know of strength of i plus w i compared to the previous one. Look here. By this inequality, this is smaller than strength of i plus one plus weight of i plus one. Right? Sorry? Oh, yeah, 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 uh, the strength of i minus one, sorry. i minus one, uh, weight i minus one. Now what I can do, I can cancel out weight of uh, i minus one here with this here, and I get uh, weight one plus weight two plus weight i minus two plus weight i is smaller than strength i minus one plus, uh, just smaller than strength i minus one. But notice, that's precisely what now t i minus one sees. It sees all of these, this is t i minus two here, right, plus the weight of t i, and we get that this is smaller than strength of i minus one. So this is, uh, 
In fact, very similar argument works to show that on your homework for Cheryl's rides, uh, that you can always do them in increasing order of the deposit. Okay. So now this means we can recurse along the order, turtles ordered by sum of strength plus weight. Well, unfortunately, this is not the end of the complications because <coughs> uh, we still don't know how to generalize the problem to allow easy recursion. Yep. You see, the problem is now, so we have now our turtles ordered by strand plus weight. Here they are. And we want to recurse. So this is now our turtle Ti. And it would be very tempting to build inductively towers over using previous turtles, enlarging the optimal, previous optimal tower whenever possible. So maybe one can say, okay, let me <coughs> uh, see optimal tower using uh, uh, first i minus one among all of these are, so this will be tj's uh, such that j is smaller than, all tj's are smaller than i minus one, right? And then we look, can I add to that optimal tower the i-th turtle? And if this is possible, I extend it, otherwise I move to the next one. What's the problem with this pseudo-solution? You see, the problem is that optimal tower of size i minus 1 cannot be used for the optimal tower of size i plus 1 because it's way too heavy. Assume that optimal tower ended up with extremely large total weight. So it is correct, but it's the total weight is huge and you will never be able to extend it. So the point, so the, the, then again, the situation is that the, the extension might be an extension of a suboptimal tower but such that the, it remains re reasonably light to be easily extendable. So what do you think, uh, what will be uh, optimal solution? So what will be, exactly, so the optimal solution is P of I J, is equal to the lightest tower of height uh, j um, among uh, the first I turtles. Why do we look for the lightest tower? Because then we have a guarantee. If any tower whatsoever can be extended to height k plus 1, then certainly the lightest tower of height k can be extended to k plus 1. then that will be the end. That's the largest you will reach the optimal solution. Right? It's, uh, so how do we uh, recurse? <coughs> uh, well, to solve the problem, 
uh, pi j, we will look <coughs> for subproblems pi minus 1, um, k for all possible k's. Um, OK, so the best is let's just solve pi j will be equal to um, sorry p i j I'm messing it up p i j will be equal p i minus one right uh, j minus one concatenated with turtle ti if the tower is legitimate. Uh, else it will be just remain p i minus one uh, j uh, pij. So what is notice? So we simply do the following. You can imagine uh, we are building the lightest tower, and assume we build the lightest tower of height one, the lightest tower of height two, the lightest tower of height three, up to whatever is the largest possible, certainly less than I, say this is k. So it's of height 1 up to k, right? So now, and this is all from turtles uh, t1 uh, up to ti minus 1. Now comes the turtle ti. You now look, can I put my turtle ti underneath? First of all, is turtle ti the lightest among all turtles seen before? If it is, then this will be the new tower of length one. Then we look at tower of size one. If I add the turtle, if I can add the turtle ti to it, if the tower is legitimate, is it lighter than this turtle, this tower? If it is, this becomes the new tower. And in general, for every of this chain, we test, can I add the turtle ti here so that this remains legitimate? If yes, is that tower lighter than the next one previously cons uh, constructed? If it is, we scrap the previously constructed one and we concatenate this turtle. <coughs> and it might happen that uh, it turns out that you can put it underneath the largest one, K, and if it's legitimate, this will become the first tower of height K plus one. And why does the recursion work? Because if there exists at all, a tower of height m that ends with your turtle ti, then certainly it can be obtained by putting ti above, below the lightest possible tower. So the fact that you are constructing the lightest towers guarantees you this optimal subproblem property that if there exists at all any tower of uh, uh, height k plus 1, say, it certainly can be obtained from the lightest tower of size k, putting the k plus first turtle on the bottom, right? So uh, please uh, read this very carefully. It's on the additional lecture notes that is on the website. And as I say, the 
dynamic programming is your big gun for the problems in the future. It's by far the most powerful. Just remember uh, the shortest, all pairs short, or shortest path where the edges can be negative. It was essentially done by dynamic programming. Um, huge number of practical problems. As I mentioned, Viterbi, Decoder, um, Smith Waterman in bioinformatics, and just huge number um, hidden Markov models. All of that are DP problems. And so it's extremely important to read all of the example and to understand what make them work. Because you will see, you can kind of then see the idea. So find the right ordering, find the right sub problems and simple recursion. These are the components in every uh, DP problem. Uh, and lo and behold, it's the most powerful technique that we covered in this uh, course. Probably in the first half, the fast Fourier transform is in industry by far the most important algorithm because it has so many different applications, right? And similarly, dynamic programming is uh, in the second part compared to greedy, it solves just vastly more problems because it's not localized, right? This takes into account the global structure of, um, of, of the problem. Okay, let's make a short five minute break and then look at uh, max flow problems. If we are going to order that in the, the with every time the lattice tower.